Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Tom Wagner. And as you know, every month we're pleased to bring a special guest to talk about the roles and responsibilities of their department. And today, very pleased to have Ryan O'Rourke with us. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Ryan is our Family Court Commissioner. I believe this is your first TV8 program, is it, it not? Is. It's been about a year now. A little over. So let's get right into it. Please start by sharing a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and when you became Family Court Commissioner. Uh, sure, I've lived in Wisconsin pretty much my whole life. I graduated from law school from UW-Madison in about 2001 and uh, went to work as an assistant district attorney. Uh, I worked here for Joe DiCecco for a number of years and then moved to Manitowoc and took a job with the county as assistant corporation counsel there. I uh, spent about eight years there doing mostly child protection work and then I came back here and was hired as court commissioner when Rebecca Persick took the bench. We're both Madtown graduates, mm -hmm. a few years apart, but uh, Badger fans. We are talking a little bit about that off the air. So as family court commissioner, set the stage a little bit. What are the roles and responsibilities? Sure, our main, our main role is to uh, lighten the load on the circuit court judges. We deal with a lot of the daily grind uh, to lessen their load. Um, uh, anything from family court to criminal court uh, to ordinance and traffic tickets. And we also serve a role as the family court services office. Uh, so we provide uh, mediation services and educational services for family court uh, to help families in the middle of divorce and all the difficulties and transition that that requires. And I've said family court twice, though it's broader than that. It's court commissioner, and some of our viewers might be wondering, well, what's the difference between a court commissioner versus a circuit court judge, federal court judge? I mean, how would you distinguish your role and compare it to a a circuit court judge? Sure, well a circuit court judge deals with uh, law on the state level. Uh, they're um, generalists, so to speak, in that they deal with a very broad range of, of law as opposed to municipal judges will deal with very specific things, usually traffic and ordinance at the city level. Uh, circuit court judges are tasked with everything from personal injury law to contract law to criminal law to family law. They have to be able to handle it all and they are really the, the heart of the judicial system uh, in that they, most people's experience, if they have an experience with a court, will be with the circuit court. And we are basically an arm of that court in that we uh, help them process cases efficiently and judiciously and try and take some of the load off of the judges by doing some of the more, I don't want to say routine, because they're not always routine, but more common tasks uh, that uh, the legislature has been comfortable delegating to non-elected judicial offices like ours. Well, you follow a tremendous track record, as you know, because Terry Burke, who I used to work with when he was our court commissioner, uh, starting 18 years ago, uh, became a circuit court judge and recently retired. And then Rebecca Persick, who was court commissioner before you, recently was elected circuit court judge. So we have big aspirations for you, Ryan. <laughs> we'll see. I know that the circuit court judges uh, really appreciate the role that you have and, and the important role that you and your staff do to support their work. Yet of our 19 departments, you're one of the smallest Touch on that a little bit. How many staff do you have? What's your annual budget? Give, give folks a little flavor for that. Sure, our uh, staff is three people, including myself. Uh, we have an assistant court commissioner and then one paralegal that uh, she really serves uh, multi-dual roles. She's an office manager, a receptionist, and, and a paralegal all rolled into one. Um, I supervise both of them and then I answer to a combination of you and the circuit court judges. Um, it's a pretty simple structure because we're not that big of an office. Our budget um, is mainly personnel expenses. Uh, we have some additional uh, revenue that we take in from various court charges that we charge the public for certain services. And then the rest of our budget is really taken up by uh, the mediation program. Uh, the budget, I think, 
I'd be guessing here. The, bu the, the budget amount is in the annual report that can be found on the website. I would, I know it's under 500,000. It's, it's certainly less than that. I know your focus is less on the ongoing, the budget and more on the people that you're providing critical services right. to. As long as we're under budget, I'm happy. And so are we. <laughs> <laughs> so are we. And that has been the track record. So you just recently became court commissioner. You mentioned that you have your law degree. You've practiced. How do you, how does one become a court commissioner? I mean, what, what, what are the credentials you'll need, the skill set you need to become a court commissioner? Well, first you have to have the law degree. Uh, normally court commissioners are lawyers who have been practicing law for an, at least, uh, I would say, the, an extended period of time. I think the minimum requirement for this position was three years, but generally you'll see more experienced lawyers uh, in that role. Uh, a lot of times there'll be lawyers who, like the circuit court judges, have a broad base of experience in different areas of law because uh, you're going to have to handle different types of law. You can't really be a specialist. Uh, as such, a lot of times uh, those uh, uh, court commissioners will either come from uh, a general practitioner standpoint as a private attorney or they'll come from county attorneys because county attorneys tend to deal with a broader uh, aspects of the law, a broader brush as to the types of topics they touch on. Um, and then I think you just have to have established a solid reputation with the judges you practice in front of for being prepared and knowing what you're talking about because ultimately they're usually the ones who decide who the court commissioner is going to be. That's for certain. As you shared though, there's a shared supervision between myself and the, the judges. I really defer that to the judges because statutorily um, they make the selection and if things aren't going well, they make the change and uh, fortunately you've just hit the ground running and I know they've really appreciated your role and the leadership and, and the good job you're doing. So we appreciate that as well. Thank you. Uh, final question before I turn it over. So it's been about a year. What have you found to be one of the more challenging or rewarding aspects of the job? From a, it's hard to answer from a reward standpoint because it's not like practicing as a trial attorney where you finish a case and you've either achieved a result that you think is right or a result that you think is wrong. Being a court commissioner is more about uh, following the legal procedures, uh, being an umpire, so to speak. Um, you're not an advocate. Uh, and uh, you can't always necessarily reach the result that you think is best Sometimes you're bound by the law and the evidence that's been presented um, and you simply have to reach the result that's right under the rules. Um, what's most interesting, I, I think I would phrase it rather than rewarding, is um, for me personally, uh, the mental health cases are interesting, uh, child protection cases are interesting, uh, the criminal law is interesting to me, but it's interesting to me because that's my background. That's what I practiced in initially. That's what I had a passion for going into the law. Um, as far as um, difficult or challenging, really for me it's the administrative end of it sometimes and finding time as to get a, out of the courtroom and actually run the office side of it and the economic side of it and finding the, the balance between those two when the focus is really on maintaining the court calendar and finding time to allow people to get into court on a timely basis so that their concerns can be dealt with. And I found the same thing with Judge Rebecca Persick and Judge Terry Burke that just as you that was not their key area of interest or concern it was more being sure that you were doing a good job serving the public and and rendering the best decisions that you could so appreciate it. Sure. Tom over to you. Thank you. Um, and you talked about some of this, but um, what types of cases are you exactly responsible for? Sure. Um, it, it runs, there's a long list. Uh, I'd start with small claims. Uh, Commissioner Schauble, uh Susan Schauble, who's the assistant that I mentioned earlier, uh, she handles small claims from the first appearance through to the end trial. Um, I handle any number of things. Let's start with criminal cases. We do initial appearances from the jail every day and hold, hold bond hearings. Uh, in family cases, we handle uh, paternity hearings. We handle stipulated divorces, 
from, uh, we do the final hearings on stipulated divorces where people are in agreement on the terms of the divorce. We also do the initial temporary orders. Say, for example, while a divorce is pending, someone needs a child support order, or they can't agree on who's going to reside in the house or how they're going to handle visitation of the children. We put in place those temporary orders while the divorce is pending. Um, we also handle traffic tickets, the initial plea hearings. That's every Wednesday. Um, I'm drawing a blank. There's a number of other <laughs> things we do. I mentioned it earlier. We handle mental health hearings. Uh, the initial hearings at the hospitals, potentially every morning. We don't have them every morning, but there's always a chance. Uh, adult protective services cases, where you're dealing with guardianships and protective placements for vulnerable adults, or uh, potentially could be vulnerable children as well. Um, we handle initial plea hearings for child in need of protection and services cases and juvenile delinquency cases. Um, we also do injunctions. That's a uh, a significant uh, portion of our caseload in uh, uh, situations where a person is seeking protection in a, from another individual either because of harassment or domestic abuse. Uh, we hold the, we make the decision on the temporary restraining order and then we also hold the final hearing for those injunctions. Uh, there's a number of other minor things we do but I would say that takes up the majority of our time. Um, I neglected to mention we also uh, authorize search warrants. Uh, when the law enforcement and the district attorney's office are requesting a search warrant, it's our office that reviews it and approves it or just or rejects it. Which means you're on call day or night. 24-7. So help me with this. Um, so it, it, it sounds like there are, there are cases that you will start and see from start to finish. Yep. And then there are cases you will start, but you will hand it off to the judiciary. Yep. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Most of the cases we will do some of the initial hearings and then the circuit court judge will take over. But the only things we handle from start to finish are the small claims uh, and the injunctions and potentially the divorce if the parties are agreed upon, are agreed to the result. Um, although I'll say this, everything we do is subject to review by a circuit court judge. So if a party's unhappy with the result, they can request a new hearing uh, from the judge. Um, that doesn't happen as often as you'd think, but there's certainly that avenue if uh, uh, they disagree with the decision we make. Interesting. So um, about how many cases do you handle within a year then? Sure, and that's for the same reason you just brought up. That's that's somewhat difficult question sure. to answer because we handle parts of cases for the most, uh, for the most part. Um, and again, we have an annual report on the county's website where you could get the exact numbers. Uh, I counted it up beforehand in the number of hearings uh, that we held when you're not counting small claims in criminal cases is over a thousand. Um, but then you have to add in all the small claims hearings and all the traffic tickets that we do because we don't keep exact numbers on those. And then we don't keep the exact number for the number of initial appearances and bail hearings that we do uh, for people held in custody. And we do that every day. And it can range from one or two to 15. So. Um, I would say the number of hearings we hold is uh, uh, probably around two, three thousand, but uh, wow. cases start to finish would be a different answer. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what cases do you find the most routine and what do you think are the most interesting that you have to deal with? Well, I didn't talk about these, but we also do what are called supplemental hearings where uh, a party already has a judgment against an individual and they haven't been able to collect that judgment so they can bring the person into court and collect their financial information to find out if there's a way to collect. Uh, those are about as routine as it gets. And uh, yeah, I have to say that's, that's not the most stimulating uh, activity I've ever uh, had. But uh, again- but Probably important to the person who's interested. Right? Sure, sure. It's just our role and it yeah. isn't that involved. Um, the most uh, interesting would, again, be the mental health cases for me and the child protection cases because and, and the reason I went into those and had a, had a passion for them, I went from criminal law to that uh, because I found those more rewarding in the fact that you can actually achieve a real positive result potentially um, rather than trying to address something after it's already gone wrong in the criminal justice system with child protection and uh, mental health, you can try and get at the root of the problem more and solve solve the problem before it becomes a bigger issue um, and hopefully actually make a difference in the long term. So, 
it sounds like a, when you, when you talk about a lot of these things, it, it, it sounds like the the whole office was created to make the system more efficient. It would be my guess. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. Is the goal is to make the make the justice system run faster, um, to get people who need to be in the court into court in a timely manner, and to free up the judges so that they can focus on. Uh, some of the more serious and complicated cases so that they aren't dealing with the daily grind quite as much of the routine procedural sure. stuff that's the same every time. You, know, you don't really need a, a, a brilliant circuit court judge to handle. You can dump it on the, the lowly <laughs> commissioner. <laughs> um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but I know you marry people I do. time to time. And uh, I don't know, where do you marry them? And do you marry them at different sites, or is it just all in one spot? I'd be sure. curious of that. Normally, it's at the courthouse. Uh, they can contact our office to schedule uh, a wedding in the courtroom. You know, we do them every Friday at 3 o'clock, and we usually have about four or five time slots. And uh, people don't have to get married there. They can request a judge or a circuit court commissioner to marry them somewhere else. Uh, normally, those are the, the judges who travel, um, and then the judicial official usually charges for that, uh, for their own time, for the travel and appearance. Uh, we don't charge for my time if you do it at the courthouse. We do charge, uh, well, we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, typically they're at the courthouse. Okay. You charge, that's what I was going to ask, and there, is there a charge for getting married? You kind of said there, there is and there isn't. Sure. If you're married, well, there's always the uh, charge for getting the marriage license, but that's handled by, right. by the county clerk. So there's that expense. And then if you get married at the courthouse, uh, there's a rental charge for the, the use of the courtroom for that time period, and it's a flat $40 fee, and it's a quarter hour time frame. Then usually the ceremony doesn't take that time, so we let people um, mill around and take pictures and, and whatnot as long as they don't go up on the bench. Yeah. And then. Uh, uh, again, if they're getting married off-site, uh, there's a potential charge for the actual judge's time to travel there and whatever. I, I don't know exactly what the sure. judges typically charge for that. It's got to be one of the most reasonable ways of getting married that exist. Sure. My daughter's going to be married in 2018, and I'm thinking this might be a far more cost-effective <laughs> approach for us to consider. Well, you mentioned Judge Burke earlier, and he actually married me and my wife. So. Oh, did he yeah, really? He did. I'll be darned. Yeah. So you've been on the other side of the... the I have. Not at the courtroom, but okay. but he traveled for us. And well, I've known people who who got married sometimes for there's some situation going on, and they might have an event late, and, you know, even a church sure. event or something like that. But because of some unique situation, I've heard of, you know, people I've known, they're going in the service or something like that. They, they want an official and then they follow up six months later or whatever yep. with another. So yep, you do, you do get a lot of that. You get a... You get a wide gamut of how serious people take the ceremony as well, too. You have the people who are just doing it to make it official, and they're going to have the big elaborate uh, event later on. And then you have other people who this is this is the event for them, so they go a little, little more all out. To each his own, right? Yep. Um, you also mediate divorces, as I understand it. So talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, it's not just divorces. We mediate uh, any family law case. I mean, okay. you could have parents of a child that were never married. It could be a paternity action or something of that nature. Uh, anytime there is an uh, issue over child placement or child custody, the matter can be referred to mediation. Uh, people can come in and request mediation on their own without a court order being involved, as long as there's a court case in existence. Uh, or a judge may refer a case to mediation. Uh, and the purpose of mediation is to try and help parties resolve the dispute in a way that's acceptable to both of them. Uh, I always encourage people when I talk to them about mediation in the courtroom that uh, they should really take it seriously and take advantage of it because it's really the last chance they have to have some control over the outcome. Otherwise, the judge is going to be and the guardian ad litem are going to be making the decisions for you. Um, what happens is we uh, have some professional counselors in the community who are on contract with us to serve as mediators. We run the administration of the program, and we uh, take in the referrals and the requests, and then we process it out and assign it to a mediator. A mediator takes it from there, meets with the parties, tries to reach an agreement. Uh, these are people who are trained and experienced in working out custody and placement disputes. Uh, and then if an agreement's reached, uh, we get a 
legal document back that the judge reviews and either signs or rejects. And if mediation is not successful, we inform the judge and they can have their day in court at that point. So. Interesting. Interesting. Adam? If you joined us late, we're talking to Court Commissioner Ryan O'Rourke about the rules and responsibility of the Court Commissioner's Office, and it is, it's a heavy topic, yes. is it not? You know, I, whenever we do an interview like this, particularly with someone in your role or uh, working at Health and Human Services or a Sheriff's Department, you know, individuals that are just working with people day in and day out and helping solve problems, uh, the weight of those issues and opportunities I I find remarkable you know we all go about our lives with things that happen at home or with our own kids or family members or we know close friends that are dealing with uh, challenging issues but every day to come to work and work on uh, you know examples that you've just shared day in and day out case after case uh, I just can't tip my hat to you enough and people who do this kind of work. So thank you, first and foremost, Ryan, for your public service. And the question I have is when you, when you have the kind of weight and the roles and responsibilities that you've described, how do you, how do you keep a good balance? How do you not take that home with you at night and, and uh, you know, make sure that you're, you're able to have a positive balance and, and focus? Sure, that, that's a wonderful question. I think you see a lot of people in, in not necessarily my line of work now, but what I used to do, struggle with that uh, as prosecutors or child protection attorneys or whatnot. Um, you deal with a lot of day-to-day -day that's not very pretty uh, and you don't see a lot of positive and it, it's over and over and over and again. And it's, it's, it's starting to be recognized and, and you see um, educational sessions about secondary trauma and how to deal with it. For me, really, uh, it changed when I had my own kids. And they were a conduit for me to um, get reconnected to the community in positive ways um, through whether it's their school or through their activities. You start to see outside of work some of the more positive aspects and get those reinforced for you that you had going in but you kind of lost along the way and um, I think everybody deals with it in their own way there's healthy ways to deal with it in unhealthy ways and uh, you got to find something that that I think keeps you connected to the positive yeah and I've often heard people say my kids help keep me grounded mm -hmm. it's a different world when you walk into that door and and uh, get to spend time with your loved ones. Well, that's great. And again, thank you for your service. I, thank you. Now we're, we don't serve in your capacity, so only you know uh, just how challenging it is, but boy, it, it's gotta be challenging work. The court system, big picture. Uh, what, what do you see as some of the, or perhaps one or two of the key challenges facing the court system as a whole as you, as you look into your crystal ball five, 10 years from now? I think the biggest thing past and going forward is, and this is a complaint I think uh, you hear a lot, not just from the court system, but other forms of government on the, um, on the levels below federal and state is, is unfunded, unfunded mandates. I, I, I think there's a tendency at the state and federal level to pass laws that, that are on their surface great and wonderful ideas and then not figure out a way to pay for them. And that puts pressure then on the court system to try and find a way to accomplish this uh, with the same amount of resources. And then it tends to take away um, from other areas of focus or, or reduce the amount of attention you can give other issues. And you just see that pressure continue and continue and continue. And, and um, one of the examples of it that, you know, from my previous life, uh, that I know about and you read about in the paper from time to time is the, the pressure put on district attorney's offices. You know, there, there's new laws, higher penalties, um, new things to prosecute, um, but no one wants to pay for the prosecutors. Uh, and that's just one example, but that's kind of the, the, the systemic court-wide um, uh, issue. I, I think that's the biggest one. District Attorney Joe DiCecco was recently yes. our guest and we had a wonderful conversation with him and his years of public service and I think he hit it right on the head. Uh, he, he shared that as one of the key 
fundamental challenges of the important work they do, that the caseload just keeps going up, the demands on state laws that need to be implemented or followed go up, and yet the resources aren't there to follow, and, and that impacts service. And, and frankly, if you heard Ryan say it, unfunded mandates. He, citizens expect government at all levels to work together, provide efficient, effective services, I and mean, we all expect that. But it's a true reality that when one level of government, and because county, counties are the right hand of the state level, when one level of government has a demand or an expectation, passes a law for a new program or service, a new law that has to be followed, uh, you know, that's fine and good, but if the resources don't come along with it to implement that, what happens is it falls on the shoulders of people like Chairman Tom Wagner and the county board then to muster the resources to implement that. And at the same time, when you have demands from the citizenry to hold the line on property taxes or reduce them, it really creates a pickle. So I, I think you hit the nail right on the head. It's not only a challenge for the court system, but for all of the programs and services we implement. We only have a couple of minutes remaining and uh, wanted to end with a little bit of discussion. I've heard you raise this before and your predecessors before that, you know, you're in a role, I think you said earlier, of you know, being an umpire and, and being fair and rendering decisions and occasionally you have clients or people that come to the office or, or your department looking for advice, looking for counsel. Sure. And that's not your role. Right. Talk about that a little bit, please. Well, we've tried to, um we actually revamped our uh, window, so to speak, at our office to put some resources out as to uh, give people you know, handouts that they can. If, if I need to do this, what do I do? I think there's a difference between legal advice and pointing people in the right direction as to how to start the process to accomplish a general task. Mm -hmm. And it's a fine line to walk. Um, me personally, because I'm the um, judicial official, uh, I try and avoid direct contact with the public about cases, even if it's a general question, uh, because you have the various ethical restraints that you can't talk to people about their cases. I can't talk to um, the father of the children about his concerns without the mother present. That It's not ethical to taint the judicial official in advance of a hearing. Um, but uh, that's our paralegal does, and Dana does a wonderful job of uh, screening those issues and uh, trying to straddle the line between what is giving people advice on what they should do versus giving people information as to how they can go about trying to uh, uh, accomplish a hearing or get a, get a court date or um, what type of paperwork they maybe need to start looking at to accomplish what they want to. Um, and it's a, it's a tricky line to walk. But. So, so what would be your advice to any of our viewers, someone that is currently interacting with your office or may in the future, if they need a starting point, if they need some information, you say you, you have some brochures, what have you, do they contact your assistant sure. and they can point them in the right direction? How do you want that? They can come and talk to, talk to Dana, a paralegal. If you, our courtroom is set up kind of weird. Uh, you have to actually go through the courtroom to get to our offices, um, but unless there's a closed hearing sign on the door, you can walk right in. Uh, and then through the door is a big window, and Dana will be behind the glass, and you can talk to her. Uh, you can also uh, access various resources on the state court website. Um, I think it's wicourts.gov or some form of that address. A general Google search should allow you to find it. Uh, and, or you can go to the clerk of court's office. That's mm -hmm. a wonderful resource too. Again, they have the same restrictions we do. They can't give you advice, uh, but they have a lot of information that can help point people in point the right people direction. Point people in the right direction, yeah. yeah. The clerk of court's office does a tremendous job. Melody Lorge and her staff are, are wonderful. Ryan O'Rourke, outstanding overview of the important roles and responsibility of the court commissioner's office. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Next month, Another very important department head is going to be here, Tom Egerbrecht from our Health and Human Services Department, and he's going to be talking about the roles and responsibilities of that department and the new drug court that recently was established and will be funded as part of the proposed 2017 budget. So until then, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next month.